Our scripture reading this morning is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Word. <clears throat> Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served with Lazarus, was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took out a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But one of his disciples, J Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As the keeper of the money bag, he used it to help himself to whatever was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. You may be seated. Hey, Lazarus, come on out. Those were the words of Jesus as he stood at the tomb of his friend. About a week before that, Lazarus was very sick. So Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, sent word to Jesus saying, He whom you love is very sick. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were some of Jesus' closest friends. They lived in Bethany which is located a couple miles east of Jerusalem. Jesus would often stay with these three when he was attending Jewish festivals in Jerusalem. Jesus waited two days, though, before heading to Bethany so that God would receive the glory and the disciples would believe in Jesus. So by the time they reached Bethany, Lazarus had been dead for four days. So let's pick up our story in John 11, verses 39 to 44. And you should have a handout, and if not, Jeremy will run and send it to you if you raise your hand. Here's what John 11 says. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. That smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believed? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. This is a backdrop to our story that Sherry read today. Jesus and his disciples are once again in Bethany, where Lazarus, Mary, and Martha live. This story is also told in Matthew 26 and also in Mark 14. In those accounts, this story actually takes place at the house of Simon the leper. No matter which house they, that all this took place, Jesus was an honored guest, and the town was jumping with excitement. All right, number two on your handouts. Bethany News headline, The Messiah is here. John 12, 1 to 2, six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. So Lazarus was at the dinner table with Jesus. Ever wonder what the dinner conversation was like? Did Lazarus tell everyone his story of how he walked into heaven? Did he share about the music he heard and the families that he saw? 
Did he experience that bright light that you hear about? The majesty of the Father. Did he share his testimony about how Jesus called him from heaven and raised him from the dead? Did he share how he changed from a spiritual body back into his physical body? Or did Lazarus turn to Jesus and privately ask him, why did you call me back? I didn't want to leave. All right, number three. What does extravagant love look like? John 12, verse 3 says, Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. Mary's at Jesus' feet. Hasn't she done this before? <laughs> well, the other time she did it was recorded in Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. During that visit, Martha was frantic, and she was running around stressed out about preparing dinner for Jesus. And there's Mary, with dishpan diarrhea, right? Sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to what he had to say instead of helping her sister. Now, instead of Martha going directly to Mary, she went to Jesus to complain. Sounds a little passive-aggressive to me. I don't know. Does it to you? Lord, doesn't it seem unfair that my sister just sits there while I do all the work? Tell her to come help me. And Jesus responds, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about, and Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken from her. So in our story today, it looks like that other day. Mary's again preparing a meal, but notice she isn't complaining in this story, is she? Maybe since that last dinner party, Martha has spent some time with her sister at the feet of Jesus. Maybe she's less worried about details and more concerned about using her gift of hospitality to serve Jesus, her brother also, and the disciples. All right, now what about Mary. At a first-century dinner table, guests reclined at the table, resting their weight on their elbow and with their feet behind them. So it would have been easy for Mary to go behind Jesus and get to his feet. She then took that alabaster jar filled with nard and poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. Now, 12 ounces of that oily perfume that smells like gladiolas, I found out when I was doing my research. So that 12 ounces would be way too much for just Jesus' feet. Well, the same story in Mark, if you look it up later, has Mary pouring perfume over his head and the rest of his body as well. But whatever happened, this was extravagant love. Nard comes from the spike nard plant, which was rare and a precious spice imported from northern India in the Himalayas. The best spike nard is, was imported in these alabaster boxes, which were opened only on special occasions. This was pure and expensive, so we know it wasn't cut with any other product. Now, alabaster, the jar itself, is a uh, snow-white marble-like material uh, of fine, uniform grain. Often it's associated with some iron in it as well. That's why sometimes you have clouding or maybe veining of the color of iron within that white stone. Now, perfume was put in these vessels and sealed with wax to prevent anything from escaping. Alabaster is a strong enough substance to keep the perfume completely contained until it's time to be opened. All right, number four, Mary lingered. Mary lingered. Can we join Mary for a minute and linger at the feet of Jesus? During our devotions, do you linger in his presence? Or are you sometimes like me, rushing through your verses and checking off devotions on my to-do list? Would you join me and give it a shot tomorrow? Let's linger at the feet of Jesus 
and not rest. You know who else lingered? King David. You remember that little boy writing all those psalms as he tended his father's sheep? He had plenty of time to linger. And what about Moses and Joshua? Their story is told in Exodus 33. Moses met with God face to face in the tent of meeting. Wherever he went to the tent, the people would get up and stand at the entrances of their own tents. They'd all watch Moses until he disappeared inside as he went into the meeting tent to talk to God. And when he went in there, the pillar of cloud, which was the presence of God, would come down from the sky and it would cover over that tent of meeting while, while the Lord was speaking to Moses. When the people saw the cloud, they bowed down to the Lord. And afterwards, the verse says, Moses would return to the camp, but Joshua, his assistant, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. See? Joshua lingered. I bet the presence of God was still lingering in that tent even after that cloud went back up in the sky. So what did King David, Joshua, and Mary know that we need to learn today? Do we need to linger in God's presence so that our intimacy with him would increase? Last week, Pastor Eddie taught us about Adam and Eve and how Adam and Eve had intimacy with God while they were in the Garden of Eden. Each afternoon, God would walk with them in the cool of the day. Yet when they sinned, that ruined their intimacy with God. God still desired intimacy with us after the Garden of Eden. He wanted it so much that he sacrificed Jesus on the cross just so we can have that intimacy. That way, Jesus can take away our sins and make us clean so that we as clean individuals can come before God for a relationship with him. The more we linger with Jesus, the closer our relationship would be. That way, as we have our devotions, as we lavishly pray and worship, Jesus will lavishly pour out healing presence on us. It isn't that, isn't that what we need? We need healed each day from the world's mess so we can face another one. Plus, we need to be healed from life's disappointments that have destroyed our childlike faith. Do you remember when you were a kid and you had that childlike faith? I want to get that back. All right, number five. Why does it always have to be about money? <laughs> All right, verses four to six. Judas Iscariot, disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief, and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Now, the nard that Mary anointed Jesus with was worth 300 denarii. All right, that represents one year's wages for a day laborer. All right, some cheaper nard costs only 100 denarii. But in our story, Mary has purchased the very best. Now, how did Mary acquire this perfume? Were they a wealthy family? Was this a family heirloom? Or was it Mary's marriage dowry or part of her inheritance? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us, but it does tell us that Mary dried Jesus' feet with her hair. Now, back in the first century, women didn't let down their hair in public. They only let their hair down for their husband. So Mary was really acting with abandoned, extravagant love, hoping that her close friends at this dinner table would understand. For goodness sakes, her brother was dead for four days, and now he's alive, right? Maybe this was Mary's act of thanksgiving to Jesus for what he did for her brother. On the other hand, Judas's objection is no surprise. His gift was, this gift was huge. Although John doesn't say it, maybe some of the other disciples probably felt the same way. 
Judas was not concerned about the poor, obviously. He just wanted his hands on that 300 denarii. Well, just for fun, let's convert 300 denarii from the first century to $2,019, all right? So I took the minimum wage in Florida, which is $8.46 an hour, times your 40 hours per week, times 50 weeks in the year, you know, two weeks off for vacation. That's $16,920 worth of perfume for 12 ounces. That's some pricey perfume. All right, guys, here's a question for you. Would we spend 17 grand on perfume and give it to our girlfriends or our wives so that she could pour it out on somebody else? <laughs> I'd be finding me another girlfriend. <laughs> All right? But what if she poured it out on Jesus? Oh, it's a different story, isn't it? Even though Jesus, Judas was a crook, he did have a point in selling it and giving the money to the poor. Or does real extravagant love give Jesus everything we have? Everything. All right, number six. Jesus defends Mary. In John 12, uh, 7 through 11, uh, I missed those couple of verses in your handout, but I'll just keep reading. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leader uh, the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus instead. So Jesus defended Mary and said that she, was, she had anointed his body for burial. The quantity of perfume was so great that the entire house was filled with its fragrance. It is likely that Jesus kept this scent on his body throughout the following week, which was Holy Week, Easter Week. So think about this. When Jesus was suffering the anguish of the crucifixion, Mary's gift of extravagant love remained. It was the last truly beautiful fragrance he smelled as he went to the cross. Mary's love went with Jesus to the cross as his love was there for us. All right, number seven. What's the significance? First of all, the whole reason that John wrote this book in the Bible was to show signs that pointed to the identity of who Jesus was. He says that in John 20, verse 31. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Second, as we have learned, Mary anointed Jesus for burial. Isn't it interesting that Mary anointed the Messiah? Well, the Hebrew word for Messiah means the anointed one. So Mary anointed the anointed one. I just thought that was kind of fun. All right, in the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed and consecrated for service. When Mary anointed Jesus, maybe she was anointing Jesus as our prophet, priest, and king. By doing so, this sealed Jesus' fate with the Pharisees. They were the prophets, the priests, and the kings, not Jesus. They didn't want anyone taking their job away from them. And by the way, Lazarus had to go too since, the res uh, since his resurrection had taken the attention of the people off of the Pharisees and onto Jesus instead. All right, thirdly, Jesus gave Mary, who's a woman in the first century, the greatest compliment in all of Scripture. Now, this should prove that God thinks of men and women as equals. It's found in Mark's account of the story. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. One little act, and here we are discussing it today. 
Wild, ain't it? All right, lastly, this story is really about the cross, about Mary's courageous understanding and acceptance of Jesus' death. It's a sign to us as readers, as we read through this story, that Jesus is, is really going to die. It's also a statement that no gift can be too precious that shows gratitude for what Jesus is about to do. We also can pour out our alabaster jars worth 17 grand, right, on Jesus because he poured himself out for us. We can give Jesus our most precious treasure, which is our hearts, in love, service, and devotion to him. And just like Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he will raise us from the eternal grave as well because he paid for our sin. So we can have that intimate relationship with our Father in heaven. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, forgive us for holding back Forgive us for not giving you every part of ourselves and, free, and for being afraid to be all in. Help us to love you extravagantly, just like you love us. Help us linger in your presence so we can work on our intimacy with you and regain that childlike faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Can we all say amen again?